Thank you, Missy. Uh, what a great reminder. If you, if you don't leave here this morning knowing anything else, know this, that you are loved, that Jesus does love you, regardless of what life is throwing at you right now, regardless of what you may feel, you are loved. And so continuing our, our series through this month, I've uh, been intentional about really hammering away at Jesus. I want us to stay focused on Jesus through the month of December. I would prefer we do it all year long. I'm not saying that. But especially during December, especially during the Christmas season, I want us to stay focused on Jesus. So today the question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? So keep that filed away in the back of your mind. And that came in handy for me this week. I needed to be reminded of who Jesus is. I had a nice, long, face-to-face look at death this week, as many of you know. My uncle uh, fell ill and has been dealing with uh, health issues for a while and has kept going downhill and further and further. And, uh, and this week, he finally uh, sir, came to those things. I saw the pain and hurt it causes. I saw the mercy and grace that God extends during the midst of these things. And here's the, the truth, and you may not realize it, we're all dying Merry Christmas. (laughs) We're we're all dying. We're all in the process of dying. Every one of us, some of us are further along than the others. We all hope to live and expect to live nice long lives, but that's not always what God has in mind for each one of us. Truthfully, none of us know when our time is up or when it's coming. And it's probably for the best, right? If we knew when our day was up, it probably we'd be miserable and be worrying the whole time. But think of it this way. Because we're sinners, yes, we're all sinners. Every breath of life we take after our first sin is because of God's grace, right? Sin is a death sentence for each one of us. And I believe we have all been appointed a time to die. That's what the Bible teaches us in Ecclesiastes 3, 2a. It says there's a time to be born and a time to die. We all need to be prepared before our end comes. Because because we rarely die when we expect it. Amen? (laughs) I don't think any of us uh, have an idea. And if we did, we'd be overwhelmed. So just a few things I want us to think about to get our minds kind of going in the right direction. Um, If you believe that there is a God and a devil, and I hope that you do. If you believe in heaven and hell, that they are real places, and I hope that you do. Uh, you want to play, pay close attention to what I'm about to share with you this morning. And here's a little note, a little warning, if you will. It doesn't matter if you believe it's true or not regarding God or heaven or hell. It's kind of like not believing in gravity or oxygen. It doesn't really matter what you think or what you believe. They exist apart from your belief. God is real. Hell is hot and eternity is forever. Right, But so is God's grace and forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? So our challenge this morning, I want us to think deeply on who Jesus is. So it's Christmas time, and so Jesus' name gets kicked around quite a bit during this season. It's critical that we understand who Jesus is and respond appropriately. Why? Because your eternity is at stake. Your eternity is at stake. So who do you say Jesus is? Let's look at our, our Bibles. If you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 16, and this is where we're going to be at this morning. Matthew 16. And just a little background to where we're at. Uh, at this time where we find ourselves in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, probably two and a half years or so into Jesus' uh, earthly ministry at this point, uh, he had performed several miracles, healed the diseased, crippled, deaf, and blind, walked on the water, and just for you people who watch some of those Jesus shows on History Channel or A&E, it wasn't a sandbar. He wasn't walking along on a sandbar. He walked on the water. It's what the Bible teaches us, right? He calmed the storms and, and the seas. Remember, peace be still, and the, and the, the, the storms and the waters obeyed him. Uh, earlier in chapter 15, he fed thousands with seven small loaves of bread and a few tiny fish. Jesus was far more than a carpenter from Nazareth, Nazareth, far more. So after feeding the multitudes, Jesus had departed from the masses and his disciples to cross over to the region of Magdala. 
It says in 1539, and after he arrived, you know, Jesus tended to, tend to draw attention wherever he went from the crowds for different reasons. But you know who also liked to follow him around? Jewish leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes of the law. They liked to always come and challenge him. And it was no different here. They caught up with him again and they confronted him asking and demanding a sign. But he refused and offered only one future sign. He said he'd offer just the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that was it. To be in the tomb. To be encased. To be dead for three days. Now, where we're at in our passage this morning, the the disciples have caught back up with Jesus. In verse 13. It said, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Pretty important question. Caesarea Philippi is a a, a town that's located roughly 25 miles to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee. So uh, that's a pretty good little trek, right? We don't don't think about it because we have cars, right? We we have cars and that's no big deal. That's just zipping right down the road. That's that's taking a ride to Oakdale for us. That's no big deal. We can be there and, you know, depending on how you drive, 20 to 30 minutes, right? So this is quite a little trek they were on. Uh, it's the northern bo- northernmost boundary of what was known as the promised land, right? From the Old Testament, the, the promised land. And it was always vulnerable to pagan influences because it was right there on the border. You have, you know, the promised land and just outside the promised land is where the pagans live, the unbelievers, the, 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 the worshipers of false gods. So right there, it was a borderland. So it's kind of ironic that Jesus would, would pick this borderland, this border town, this area, to, to draw his disciples to himself and to ask them this question, who do the people say that I am? Because they could be on the border as well, right? They're on the fence of deciding who Jesus is. It's the most important question that anyone would ever ask. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Jesus wasn't unsure of public, uh, public perception. He knew. He knew exactly what they were thinking. He's God. He knew what they were saying about him. He wanted to expose how much public opinion could influence the disciples. We talked about that a little bit this morning in in Sunday school and and how uh, uh, perception or the society or the things of the culture tend to influence us, whether we want to or not. So while we need to guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our ears, what we watch, what we read, people we spend time with, it affects us. You say, well, Brother Mike, uh, I'm not subject to the public opinion and none of that stuff really affects me right so can public or popular opinion influence christians today Hmm? you better believe it you better believe it look around right immorality is rampant i'm talking about amongst christians i'm talking about the church immorality is rampant divorce is rampant shacking up is rampant worldliness is rampant how do you think that happens in the church and among god's people By living according to the cultural standards and not the Bible standards. Right? Well, it's legal. We just passed a law. It's legal. Or or, or, or it's not not illegal. How about that? There's no law against it. Right? Well, it's not what God's Word says. By living according to the cultural standards, we call ourselves problems. We better be influenced by Scripture and not popular opinion of what culture adopts as normal god's word the bible says there's two possibilities you know we could if we want to go and be like the world there's two possibilities it don't turn out well the bible says that we have two possible ways the broad way and the narrow way y'all y'all know where i'm heading with this right two lines of thought look at matthew 7 13 14 of course this is referring to salvation and Jesus, but it, it has a broader uh, uh, concept that goes along with it as well. Matthew seven thirteen and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many, many. One more time. That's right. Many. Even the, even the babies know. Many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few, few, few who find it. 
You want to be popular? You want to go with public opinion? You want to go with the flow? The Bible says that leads to destruction. You know what destruction's code word for? Hell. I'll say it for you. Hell. And so what we're talking about today is important. We need to understand who Jesus is. And he liked to use this term for himself. He called himself the Son of Man. Son of Man. It's Jesus' favorite designation for himself. He used it over 80 times in the New Testament. And it wasn't just a random title. It wasn't something he just picked up. It was something that the Jews would recognize and clearly know as a title for the Messiah. So when he would say the Son of Man, it was almost like shoving it in their face. Because they would know, they knew exactly what he was claiming. Look at Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. It says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Jewish leaders hated it when he called himself that. Couldn't stand it. Do you know why? It's because he wasn't the Messiah they wanted. He wasn't the Messiah they wanted. Doesn't that sound familiar? Hmm? You ever had a conversation with somebody talking about the Bible and, and what God's, you know, what God's word says and, you know, laying out, you know, clearly and, and you know, say, well, I, I'm not so sure. I'm on the fence about this, you know, gay thing. I'm not sure that's anything wrong with that. Cause, and then they'll say this, because my God, my God wouldn't treat, view people that way. My God wouldn't do that. My God wouldn't act that way. Right? My God wouldn't. Apparently, for most people, Jesus isn't the Messiah they want either. Right? We better know who Jesus is. Look at verse 14. We see their response. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. All very nice answers. All very respectful answers even. But all very wrong answers. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Jesus' first cousin, right? Uh, He was beheaded by Herod earlier. Herod the Tetrarch because of a promise made out of lust for his live-in's daughter. If you remember the story, it was a birthday celebration and uh, she come out and dance for him and, and pleased him, and he offered, made a promise to her, ask me anything up to half my kingdom, I believe it was, and I'll do it for you. And she went back to her mama, and she said, we want John the Baptist's head on a platter. All right? So we went back, and he had to, had to keep his word. So that was it for John the Baptist, beheaded. All right? The people rejected Jesus as Messiah, but they could accept him as a resurrected John the Baptist. That's what's kind of funny that, that we, not the Messiah, but, but, but we're, because that's kind of, we don't want you to be that, but we will accept you as a resurrected John the Baptist. Hmm. Jesus is John the Baptist resurrected back from the dead to herald the coming of the Messiah. So a resurrected forerunner of the Messiah heralding the coming of the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, not the messenger of the Messiah. They also said Elijah. Good old Elijah. The Jews viewed Elijah as the greatest prophet of all, so this is very respectful to say this. They also knew that he would be sent back to God's people before the Messiah's return. Right? So they're looking for signs. I mean, they're, they're trying to put this thing together. It all goes back to Jesus not being who they want him to be. Talked about Elijah's return in Malachi 4 5. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. See, they're putting these things together. They got proof. I got by scripture that, 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 that this, this guy, this, he's not the Messiah, he's, he's Elijah. He's John the Baptist, right? No? How about Jeremiah? Jeremiah. He, maybe he's Jeremiah. And so you have to go to some extra biblical writings to be able to put that one together. 
Uh, if you're familiar with the Apocrypha books, uh, that's where you'll find uh, this information. Um, they had Jeremiah depicted as having taken the ark and the altar from the temple before the Babylonians desecrated the temple back in the Old Testament. They believed that Jeremiah would return the ark and the altar to the temple prior to the Messiah's return. Right? You're not going to find that in the Bible anywhere. That's why I say extra biblical writings in the apoc- apocryphal books. But nevertheless, that's what they thought. And then one last one, just to, to cover all the bases, maybe just one of the prophets. One of the prophets, a prophet, this was the catch-all. They knew he was a special messenger like the prophets of old. They couldn't deny his miracles. They had to explain it, you know, try to justify it some way, shape, or form. They were close, but not close enough. Listen to what John MacArthur says. He says, in each instance, the people considered Jesus to be a forerunner of the Messiah, but not the Messiah himself. They could not deny a supernatural power, but they would not accept him as Messiah and Savior. They came as close to God's ultimate truth as they could without fully recognizing and accepting it. How tragic. How tragic. It still happens today. Every day. They were all wrong. Any, jan- any answer but Jesus is the Christ is insufficient. It's insufficient. Verse 15, now Jesus gets nice and personal with the disciples. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Hmm? Who do you say that I am? After hearing the opinions of others, Jesus wants wants a direct answer from his disciples. It's the same for every one of us, every single one of us. Jesus, Jesus isn't really interested or concerned with what others think. Right? Jesus is concerned with what you think. You will answer for you. Hmm? You will answer for you. There's no group plans for eternal life. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A lot of yous there. Hmm? Very personal, isn't it? There's no y'all or we. It's you. It's not your mom. right? It's not if your mom or dad confesses. You hear me, mom and dads? Your kids aren't saved because you're saved. They're not riding into eternity on your coattails. right? It's not if your husband or wife confesses. right? Husband, wife, believer, your husband, they're not saved. They're not going with you, right? It does, it's, there's no group plan. It says if you confess, you'll be saved. You. Get it? You. It's individual. It's not a complex question. Who do you say I am? That's what Jesus says. In verse 16, Peter speaks up first. Imagine that, huh? Anybody shocked by Peter being the first one to blurt out an answer? Peter had a habit of doing that. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mm. Peter was the leader of the twelve. Peter nailed it. right? Nailed it. You couldn't ask for a better answer. It was perfect. Jesus is, in fact, the long-awaited Messiah of God. Peter Peter had seen all the signs he had done. He was part of the inner circle, right? Peter, James, and John. He was close to Jesus. But even Peter, along with the rest of the the Jewish people, was expecting a conquering Messiah like David to overthrow the Romans. Yet now, something happened. Something happened. Something changed in, in Peter's heart. Something changed in Peter's mind. Now he knew without a doubt who Jesus was. He is the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and don't be confused when you see these words get changed around. You'll see, sometimes you'll see Christ and sometimes you'll see Messiah. All Christ is is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah. It's the same meaning. Same meaning. For us, and what Peter says here, the Son of Man is the Son of God. And there's only one right answer to that question. But here's the truth. Here's the kicker. 
here's the, uh, the thing we need to all remember, that we'll never, never come to know this truth on our own. Ever. It won't happen. Look at verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Hmm. Jesus didn't commend Peter for being smarter than everyone else. He didn't, I can't imagine Jesus stepping back and like, you know, bravo, bravo, you figured it out. No, I think just the opposite, really. He said, blessed are you because you understand this beautiful truth. God the Father gave Peter that understanding of who Jesus was. That's how it happened. God the Father gave him understanding. Not just books. Books are good. I'm not against books. i got lots of books. Lots of good books. All right? But books alone aren't sufficient. You're not going to come to know who Jesus is just by books. You may have some head knowledge, but you won't understand it in your heart. Not just great sermons. That's not going to do it either. That's not going to give you that understanding. You know, you may have more, more knowledge, more, more uh, information. Not just powerful testimonies. That's not going to be enough either. Nope. And not just consistent and accurate evangelism. Man, people can just over and over and over just beat you to death with Jesus. Right? You can say it backwards, forwards, upside down, however you want it. Uh, admit, believe, confess. Come to a revival every night of the week. Until God the Father gives you the understanding, until God the Father blesses you, you will never get it. Never get it. Ever. Ever. Now, God works through these things. All these things, He works through them. But ultimately, it's God's responsibility to open our eyes. And that's not just my opinion. I know some of y'all are probably sitting there disagreeing in your, in your head, in your heart, and y'all getting mad. And that's fine. You can get mad all you want. Because the Bible says it. That's what the Bible teaches. I got scripture. Do you have scripture to support your, your opinion? Because I got scripture. Look at John 6, 44 and 45. Mark this down. No one, no one, no one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Is that pretty clear? Pretty clear, huh? And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. They shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father does what? Comes to me. Hmm? Let me do it one more time. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Right. So in closing this morning, the truth of the matter is this. It really doesn't matter what everyone else thinks about Jesus. It really don't. When each of us stand before God on Judgment Day, it won't make a difference what everyone else thought about Jesus. It won't. It will only matter what you thought and how you responded to that knowledge. That's it. That's the only thing that's going to matter. Each of us will be judged individually based off of how we answered that one question. So I'll ask it one more time this morning before we close. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? There's only one right answer. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. So have you responded to God blessing you with that understanding? If so, amen. Amen. If not, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? 
And I would say, surely the Father is drawing some this morning. Surely He wouldn't give me this word, this message this morning without having a reason for it. Surely He's drawing some this morning. So do you. He's drawing. It's time to surrender. It's time to surrender. It's time to be forgiven. It's time to settle your eternity with King Jesus. And why do I say this? Not as a threat, but as a warning. Because I love you. The Lord loves you. We know not when our time is up. Let's play. Let's pray. And we'll have a time to respond to God's word. Father, we are so grateful. So grateful for who you are. We are so grateful for your grace and your mercy in our life, God. Father, when we understand uh, who we are, we understand that uh, we're sinners. We understand that that sin is a death sentence, that we have no hope apart from you. God, we should be desperate for you. Desperate for you, desperate to, 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 to be with you, to be restored to you. God, I thank you for your word this morning, Father, the, the clarity of the scripture. Thank you that, that uh, our efforts, our evangelism, our, our sharing the gospel, Father, isn't, just, uh, isn't the end that uh, people don't come to know you based off of how well we share the gospel or how well we represent you, Father, that the scripture is clear that, that nobody comes to Jesus unless you draw him to yourself. So, Father, in these, this quiet time, Father, as we end this morning's service, Father, I pray that, that you would be moving on hearts right now, God. I pray that you would be encouraging people to, to lay down uh, the, the, their lives, Father, that they would surrender, Father, they would not just walk to you, but run to you, Father, that, that sur- uh, salvation would come today. Father, give people the boldness, the boldness to step out, the boldness to, to run to you, the boldness to, to claim that new life that comes only through Christ. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.